Today we join together with several hundred Austin area churches in a simultaneous study called What's After? We're going to take a look at the phenomenon of near-death experiences and try to find out if those experiences can teach us something about life after death. I'm sure you've heard about near-death experiences, people who are pronounced clinically dead, they're no brain activity, they were flatlined, and then they were resuscitated. And they talk about experiences they had on the outskirts of another glorious life. About 13 million Americans, about one in 25, have had a near-death experience. Could this be evidence for an afterlife? You know, the vast majority of Americans believe in some sort of afterlife, some sort of conscious existence beyond death, and not just religious people. Uh, a great number of people who would be called the nuns, people who would check on a survey form, are you a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian? And they would check the box, none, none of the above. Even they indicate an interest in this topic of life after death. In a 2018 survey, uh, among other things, Americans were asked, do you think that there is life or some sort of conscious existence after death? And nearly three out of four said yes. And the number actually went higher if you had some sort of college education. 78% uh, of those who had gone to college believed this as opposed to 69% of those who had not gone to college. Vast numbers in our culture then believe in some sort of conscious existence after death. But of course, you don't have to have a survey to know that this is true. Just look at what archeologists would call our cultural artifacts our Hallmark cards, our best-selling books, and even a number of our popular movies, they all focus on this conviction that the soul lives on after death. Just for one example, consider the movie City of Angels. Nicolas Cage plays an angel named Seth, and he at one point comes to visit a heart surgeon named Maggie, played by Meg Ryan. In this next scene, Maggie has just lost one of, her, one of her heart patients in surgery, and Seth meets her for the first time as a human visitor in the hospital hallway. Excuse me. Are you a visitor? Yes. Well, visiting hours have been over since eight. Well, why do they have that? What? Hours. Doesn't it help the patient to be visited? Well, who are you visiting, Mr. Messenger? Right now? Yeah. You. I don't need a visitor. You're not ill? No. I'm one of the doctors here. Are you in despair? I lost a patient. You did everything you could? I was holding his heart in my hand when he died. And he wasn't alone. Yes, he was. People die. Not on my table. People die when their bodies give out. It's my job to keep their bodies from giving out. Or what am I doing here? It wasn't your fault, Maggie. I wanted him to live. He is living. Just not the way you think. I don't believe in that. Some things are true whether you believe in them or not. So most people in our culture believe that the soul lives on after death. Could it be that near-death experiences offer evidence that these convictions are true? Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you might wonder what to make of near-death experiences. But here's the thing. Many of us who are believers in Jesus Christ also wonder what to make of near-death experiences. Somebody asked R.C. Sproul about near-death near experiences some time back, and here's what he said. 
we as Christians do believe that we have a continuity of personal existence and that the cessation of physical life is not the end of actual life. Whether we're good or bad, whether we're redeemed or unredeemed, we're going to continue in a living state, though not biologically alive. It shouldn't shock the Christian when people undergoing clinical death and being revived come back with certain recollections. I've tried to keep an open mind, and I hope that this interesting phenomenon will get the benefit of further research, analysis, and evaluation. Too many of these experiences have been reported for us to simply dismiss them as imaginary or as hoaxes. Notice that Dr. Sproul expressed his hope that this phenomenon would get the benefit of further research, analysis, and evaluation. In fact, researchers and physicians have done all of that and are continuing to do all of that. For the last several years, for the last couple of decades, in fact, there's been a tremendous amount of research on the phenomenon of near-death experiences. And these researchers and these physicians have written up their findings in such reputable journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association and The Lancet. It is fascinating to me to read reports of people who have gotten to the outskirts of another life. But I like to think of it like this. Let's say that you went to downtown Austin and went to the Texas State Capitol building and you went through those huge doors and you got into the lobby and you looked around and then you left. You could not claim to be the world's leading authority on all the Texas State Capitol building has to offer just from your vantage point of standing in the lobby. In fact, if you tried to report on your experience and your uh, suppositions about the rest of the Texas State Capitol building, you might end up misinterpreting certain things. You wouldn't uh, understand why certain things were set up the way they were. You might uh, misinterpret the way certain things were set up the way they were. Well, when I read these stories of people who've had near-death experiences, it's something like that. They've had a remarkable experience, but they've only gotten so far as the lobby. Now, that being said, it's still incredibly fascinating to hear their stories from the lobby. And it makes me pause and wonder about all that God has got in store for us beyond the lobby. John Burke is a local pastor and he's a New York Times bestselling author. And he has interviewed a number of people who have had near-death experiences. Let's see what he has to say. I knew that I had been underwater already too long to still be alive. My spirit rose up and out of the river. I saw my body being pulled to shore. I saw the guys start CPR. And I could look at my body and recognize that that was my body, that that represented my life here. We were in an accident where another horse ran into my horse. She reared up, flipped over backwards with me on her back, and fell across my body. As she hit my chest, I immediately left my body. I was up 30, 40 feet in the air. I was looking down at a airplane that had crashed. I had seen a body over here that was dead, but I knew this body really well. Right then, it hit me. I'm not in my body. There's my body, but here's me. I've always been fascinated with these near-death experiences. And by near-death, I don't mean like they almost got hit by a car. I mean like dead, dead. At first, I was very skeptical of these. But I'll tell you, after studying over a 1,000 of these near-death experiences, it's changed my mind. I was in this experience for what felt to me like many, many, many hours. But in fact, the entire thing was probably 30 minutes. It was like we had this wave of light under our feet pushing us forward. And it was almost as if I could see the stars go by. I began to see a small, bright, brilliant glow that got bigger and bigger and bigger. So how do we know these people were truly dead? Doctors, cardiologists, oncologists have actually been able to look at medical records to show, yeah, these people were truly dead by all the ways that we would clinically talk about death. The nine wheels of the driver's side of the truck just rolled over the car. So I was just really killed instantly, blunt force trauma. They pronounced me dead on the scene. As to how long I was clinically dead without brain function or heart function, at least 30 minutes. 
According to the medical records, it was an hour and 45 minutes that I was not breathing or heart beating during that time frame. So in the sense of a skeptic, I always tell them, you may say I didn't go to heaven, but you can't say I didn't die because it didn't have any brain wave at that time. That fact that the near-death experiences are occurring during that time that consciousness should be a blank slate is medically inexplicable. It should be impossible for them to be remembering anything. Having looked at my medical records, corroborated as many details as I could about the scene at the river, I ultimately concluded that my experience was outside the realm of science and outside the realm of medicine. Scientists postulate there must be at least five dimensions to make sense of some of the things science is discovering. Is it so crazy to think about what comes after this life? I'm so glad you decided to join in this conversation. In it, you're gonna hear from very credible people, doctors, college professors, commercial airline pilots, and other professionals who only lose credibility in their profession by talking about their experience and yet they say it's the most real thing that ever happened to them. I'm John Burke, and after 30 years of researching over a thousand of these accounts, I wrote the book, Imagine Heaven, and a shorter booklet called What's Afterlife, conveying more of the evidence of the afterlife you just heard. My dad was dying of cancer, and at the time, I didn't really believe in God or the afterlife or any of it, but I picked up a book someone had given my dad. It was actually the first research written on near-death experiences, or NDEs. I read it cover to cover that night, and at the end said, whoa, maybe the afterlife is real. I mean, maybe there really is a God, and if so, I've gotta find out more. Because I kept thinking, how do I explain so many people, clinically dead, resuscitated by modern medicine, then saying very similar things, and as I would later discover, all around the world. I've since gone from a career in engineering to become an author, researcher, and a pastor out of a desire to help people learn what I learned, what changed my mind. My research centered on the common threads indie ears share, what they tell us, and more importantly, what that means today. You'll meet some of these people in the video series and many more in the What's After Life booklet. The Gallup poll found that one out of 25 Americans has had a near-death experience. That means close to 13 million Americans had an experience like this. And more than 900 scholarly articles have been written in prestigious peer-reviewed journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association, The Lancet, Europe's prestigious medical journal, Psychiatry, and many others. We'll walk through a series of questions over the weeks to come, and as we do, some important filters will help us understand what kind of science applies here, as well as the limits of science. This week especially, we're gonna zero in on whether there really is reliable data to support the accounts of NDEers. You know, NDEers are trying to explain something extra-dimensional. I mean, imagine if your experience of life were being lived on, on a flat, two-dimensional, black and white picture on the wall. Then when you die, you leave that flat, two-dimensional picture and you're brought out into a three-dimensional room of color. But then after experiencing a three-dimensional world of color, what if you got pressed back into that flat black and white world? How would you describe three dimensions of color in flat 2D black and white terms? That's the challenge indie ears face. And sometimes they sound odd as they grasp for language that makes sense in our finite limited dimensions. Now I, like many of you, am a skeptical engineer type. So I get it if some of you are thinking, how do you know these stories aren't just made up? Or the lingering effects of drugs, or a hallucination, or a dying brain? Well, the evidence has actually convinced many skeptical doctors. Let's hear from one of them. People may wonder, are near-death experiences falsified? How do we know they're real? Well, all near-death researchers that I'm aware of believe that vanishingly few near-death experiences are shared that are falsified. Some people have wondered if near-death experiences are due to drugs or anesthetic agents. In having studied over 4,000 near-death experiences, the great majority of these people that had them were not taking any psychotropic, that is, brain-acting medication at the time of the experience. So there's no chance that drugs could account for what's observed in near-death experiences. Some skeptics have proposed that near-death experiences are due to hypoxia, which is low blood oxygen levels. Well, that's a reasonable hypothesis because after all, at the time of a life-threatening event, 
typically you are gonna have reduced oxygen levels in the blood as a result of the trauma or injury that led to that close brush with death. In any other altered type of human consciousness, dreams, hallucinations, uh, psychotic events, you typically have confused sensorium. Experiences may skip around in dreams that are very common. You really have that hypo or decreased lucidity, and that's completely different in near-death experiences, which are hyper or increased lucid, tends to be very logically and ordered. I can't find a single skeptical explanation of near-death experience that any reasonable, well-informed person would accept as explaining near-death experience. One of the strongest lines of evidence for the reality of near-death experience is they shouldn't happen at all. At the time of a cardiac arrest, when your heart stops, well, of course, immediately, blood stops flowing to the brain. 10 to 20 seconds after that event, the EEG electroencephalogram, which is a measure of brain electrical activity, goes absolutely flat. It should be impossible to have a lucid organized experience at that time, and yet by the hundreds, People have reported near-death experiences immediately following a cardiac arrest, and that is medically inexplicable. Another skeptical cardiologist, Dr. Michael Sabum, studied the fascinating case of Pam Reynolds, the singer-songwriter who had a brain aneurysm. To treat it, Pam's body temperature was lowered to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or 10 degrees Celsius. Her breathing and heartbeat were stopped. The blood was drained from her head completely. Her eyes were closed with tape and small earplugs with speakers emitting 100 decibel clicks were put into her ears so that they could ensure that she had a, a flat EEG or a non-responsive brain. In other words, she couldn't see, hear, and she had no brain waves. And yet, after recovery, she claimed she had died and left her body and watched the surgery from up above. She described how she saw the saw that they used to open up her skull, and it didn't look like what she thought it would. It looked like an electric toothbrush, and she described a plastic case with blades. She accurately described a tense situation when a female doctor couldn't find a vein in her leg and was told by a male doctor, try the other leg. All this checked out, yet how could she have known? Dr. Janice Holden, professor of psychology, studied 93 cases of NDEs like Pam. She found that 92% of the observations that indie ears made were completely accurate. Another 6% only had minor variations. One case out of the 93 was inaccurate. Pam and thousands of others like her demonstrate that when people die, they leave their bodies, but they have a new body, a spiritual body. Though modern resuscitation techniques are today revealing lots more of these stories, they're actually not new. Plato wrote in The Republic about a soldier who had a near-death experience. The Tibetan Book of the Dead talks about some aspects similar to modern NDE accounts. The writers of the Jewish scriptures report several resuscitations, and the Christian New Testament records Jesus raising Jairus' daughter and Lazarus from the dead. Paul, who wrote many of the New Testament books, may have had an NDE when he was stoned to death in Lystra. He revived and later writes exactly what NDEers report around the globe today. He said, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know, only God knows. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and I heard things so astounding they cannot be expressed in words. Later he says, our bodies are buried in brokenness but they will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. A new spiritual body is just one of the common experiences. What are others? Well, after people die, they say they leave their bodies, often observe their resuscitation, but they still have a body. We're ourselves, more ourselves than we've ever been. And not just with five senses, more like 50 senses, they say. Commonly, they feel a peace like never before. They travel, some through a tunnel or what they describe as a pathway to a place so beautiful as to defy description. Not unlike Earth, with mountains, streams, trees, flowers, but with a vibrancy and a life that they just know this is what I was created for. Many encounter a God of light who is unconditional love and personal, even humorous, knows them inside out, and then many get a life review with this God of love, and he lets them relive their lives to understand why love matters most. At that point, they're told it's not their time. They still have a purpose on earth to fulfill, 
and they're resuscitated. They wanna share this out of this world experience but struggle to find words. And when people hear it and respond like they're delusional, they often stop talking openly about it. In John Burke's research, many of the people who had a near-death experience report coming before a being of light and a being of overwhelming love. And many of them instinctively know that they're standing before Jesus Christ himself. And somewhere along the way in their experience, this being of light and love tells them that it's not yet their time and they have to go back into earthly life. And at that point, they are resuscitated. Now, when we began this study this morning, we had Margaret and Casey read a story to us from Matthew chapter 9. And what's interesting is in that story, Jesus did the same thing that many people who've had a near-death experience say Jesus did for them. The difference is that in a near-death experience, Jesus, glorified and glorious, sends them back into earthly life. And in this story in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is on our side of death, and he's calling this girl back into earthly life. Either way, though, it's the same remarkable power that is at work. I love the little details that Luke and Mark include in their version of this same story in their Gospels. They mention that the synagogue ruler's name was Jairus and that his daughter was 12 years old. I think it makes it all the more poignant to know the man's name and know the age of the daughter who died. And Luke and Mark also give us this detail. They say that Jesus spoke to her. He took her by the hand, and in his native Aramaic, he said, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. Now, the word Talitha doesn't just give us her youthfulness or her age. It is a pet name. It's kind of a term of endearment. It might be somewhat like what you're probably going to say to one of your children in this upcoming week five of our shelter at home orders, where you say, it's time to log on and go to school, honey. It's time to get up. Now, many who've had a near-death experience say that they were sent back by Jesus. This little girl in Matthew chapter nine could say that she was called back by Jesus, but it's the same experience you see that is taking place. These people who've had a near-death experience met the same kind of Jesus that this little girl met in Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew 9, we see Jesus with his overwhelming control over this last enemy of humanity called death. But even as he's absolutely powerful, he's also personable, affectionate, speaking kindly to this little girl as if he is waking her up on a fresh April morning. Talitha, kum. Time to get up, honey. This is why Jesus is so much more than just a uh, great moral teacher, so much more than just a great example about how to live uh, the human life. There are a lot of people that assume that that's all that Jesus is, and then they run across stories like this one here in Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus claims total authority over death itself. Now, here's the thing. The little girl in this story in Matthew chapter 9, she died again. And we don't have a biblical account of that. Maybe she grew up. Maybe she got married. Maybe she had kids of her own. Maybe she got old. But invariably, she died again. And those who've had near-death experiences, they're going to die again. And this time, they won't be resuscitated. They won't walk out of the hospital. Their loved ones will gather around their casket as it's lowered into the ground. But what Matthew chapter 9 shows us, and maybe what these near-death experiences show us, is that Jesus is capable of doing something grand and glorious for us on into the future. As the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright puts it, the New Testament isn't just telling us about life after death. The New Testament wants to tell us about life after life after death. In other words, while many Americans kind of hope for a conscious existence beyond death, the New Testament documents tell us, oh, there's so much more than that. At the end of time, Jesus is coming again to set right all that's wrong with this world, and he's going to raise us up in resurrection glory so that in our permanent resurrection bodies, we'll be able to enjoy a new heaven and a new earth. That's what the closing chapters of uh, the book of Revelation have been all about. Now, I want to be in that number. How about you? You know, when people sing, when the saints go marching in, 
I think for a lot of people, it's just a peppy jazz number, or it's uh, something to cheer on their favorite football team from New Orleans. But originally, it was an African-American spiritual with confident biblical truth, such as this. Some say this world of trouble is the only one we need, but I'm waiting for that morning when the new one is revealed. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Lord, how I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Now, how do we get a chance to be in that number? Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 40. My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. We look to the Son of God, and we believe in Him. Now, what does that mean? That means that we trust that His heroic work on the cross was for us, that on the cross He was our substitute. He was carrying away our flaws and our failures so that we might have an eternal relationship with God. And if we look to him, if we trust what he has done, Jesus says one day he is going to stand before our graveside. One day he is going to stand at the place where our ashes were scattered and he is going to say, Talitha, kum, get up, child. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray for all who are listening to this message that we might all place our faith in the work of the Son, the heroic work of the cross, so that we might know eternal life here and hereafter. And those of us who've put our faith and trust in this, we pray that you would help us to adjust our attitudes and our living in accordance with the fact that you have done this great thing for us and you are coming to bring us into a wonderful new afterlife after this life is done. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.